I want to share with you that I've, I've grown up snow skiing. I love snow skiing. I've skied for the majority of my life. And when I think about going skiing, I often think back to this experience I had uh, when I was in high school. I was skiing with my high school Bible study leader. I always loved skiing with this guy named Billy because he always seemed like he was trying to figure out what he couldn't do on skis. And so that's kind of a fun person to ski with because he's just trying everything until he figures out, oh, that's actually something that doesn't work on skis. And so I remember we were skiing down a run together and there was just this moment where he turned to me and he was like, follow me. Like, I don't know if you know what happens when someone just says those two words, but you should probably do it. And I'm pretty sure I was going through puberty at the time. I kind of hit it late. So I'm pretty sure I was like, sounds good, Billy, let's do it. And so... Billy exits the run and just goes into the trees. And so if you have skied a lot, then you know that's a pretty normal thing. When you are going down a run, uh, you can kind of go off into the trees and there's runs through the trees. Well, we just kept going further and further and further back into the trees to the point where the trail stopped. So it was just us and powder in trees and so we are making our way through trees we are ducking under trees we are just making our way through the trees and it's it's uh, it's complex to the point where i am only focused on myself i am just figuring out how to not die from hitting a tree and so i'm pretty zeroed in on what i'm doing and just for a moment i glance up to see where billy is and i realize that billy has stopped and i'm about to hit him now you might be thinking well you should just stop here's the thing when you're skiing in the trees you can't just quickly turn and stop or you're gonna yard sail everywhere because your skis are gonna hit all the trees and so here's what i decided to do i decided that i was just gonna go to the right and fall so I wouldn't hit my Bible study leader because he had made an investment in me. Anyway, um, so I go to the right and I just sit down. I think if I just sit down, it'll, it'll be an easy way to fall. Well, the problem is when I sat down, my skis stayed upright and I just kept going down the mountain and I just started picking up speed. And so I'm sitting there on my skis picking up momentum because there's not as much wind resistance and I look up and I just soar off of a boulder. It felt like I fell 50 feet. I probably fell about 10 feet, but I just fly through the air and land in powder up to my waist. It was terrifying. My Bible study leader is playing it through his mind like, so I'm going to be calling this kid's parents and just telling them how it all ended for Timothy Atik. But uh, so I find myself in powder. I kid you not, I am shaking a tree like, Billy, Billy, I'm over here. So that is what's happening. That's my scenario. And I just remember digging out and Billy caught up with me and we, we found ourselves just in the middle of the forest, it felt like, and we were like, we don't know where we are on this mountain. We just saw this opening in the trees and we were like, we're gonna ski through that opening. And that opening could actually be the edge of the mountain and we're just gonna go off the edge of the mountain or it's just gonna be another run and we're gonna jump on that. Turns out it was just another run. So uh, anticlimactic ending there. But the reason that I tell you that is because those two words, follow me, are very powerful words. I'm just telling you, anytime someone looks at you and says, follow me, I promise you, things will be very uncertain. Adventure is a strong possibility, but there will be risk. And the reward can be great. I tell you that because as we step back into the Gospel of John, we are going to look at Jesus calling his first disciples. And guess what two words comprised his invitation to his disciples? Follow me. And the invitation that he gave to his disciples, follow me, is the same invitation that's on the table for every single one of us. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, it is because you have responded to that invitation, follow me. 
And you need to know that to follow Jesus, it will feel like the future at times is uncertain. And adventure is definitely in the works. And there will be risk. But the reward can be great. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to give you three things that you need to know about following Jesus and experiencing the fullness of joy that can come from responding to these two words, follow me. If you have a Bible, turn with me tonight to John chapter one. If this is your first time with us this semester, we are just walking through the gospel of John. We're a Bible study, that's what we do. You can count on it that every week we will gather together and we will study the Bible. This is not opinion time with TA. This is us looking at the word of God. We will read some, I will explain it, and then we will apply it. That's how it goes. So I'm just going to read you a big chunk of scripture right now. John chapter 1. We're going to finish chapter 1. So if you've been here the last three weeks, it's taken us three weeks to get through three, cha- or three weeks through one chapter. Okay, here we go. Verse 35, chapter 1. It says this, the next day... Again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We've found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened in the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So in this passage, what happens is we get introduced to four of Jesus's 12 disciples. If you're not familiar with the Bible, Jesus really had 12 close friends who were called his disciples. A disciple, that word in the Greek, it simply means learner, but what Jesus meant by them being his disciples is they would be his followers, and we will find out more what that looks like as we go on. But tonight I'm going to give you three things about following Jesus. The first thing that I need you to know is this, following Jesus begins with C. Seeing Jesus. Following Jesus begins with seeing Jesus. We talked on the first night of the semester about this idea of spiritual sight. Where I get that from is Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Jesus is on a boat with his 12 friends right after he's fed thousands of people with just a few pieces of bread and a few pieces of fish. And his followers begin to freak out that they don't have bread. And Mark 8 tells us this, Jesus, aware of this, said, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Watch this. Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And so Jesus draws a connection between your heart and sight. And he's saying it's possible to have eyes and yet still not see him. You might be able to see physically, but you can't see 
spiritually. So when I say that following Jesus begins with seeing Jesus, what I'm saying is following Jesus begins with you having spiritual sight, that your heart is awakened and alert and able to see Jesus. I believe that we see these disciples right here in chapter one gain spiritual sight. Now keep in mind, what we're seeing is just small seeds of faith. Like these disciples do not have what we have. They do not have the knowledge of Jesus yet that we have. They did not, Jesus had not died yet. He had not conquered death through the resurrection. These people are just getting acquainted with Jesus and yet they see him like no one else has seen him. The reason I say that is because John the Baptist says to Andrew, what does he say? He says, behold, the Lamb of God, what's he saying? He's saying, see, have, have spiritual sight to see the Lamb of God. And what's Andrew's response? Verse 41 tells us he first found his own brother Simon. And what does he say to him? We have found the Messiah. We have found him. This is the one that our people have been waiting for. This is the anointed one, the promised one, the long-awaited one. Nathaniel... Just think about his story. Philip comes to him and says, hey, we've found the guy, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 46, Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and what? Come and see. So Nathanael comes and he sees Jesus. And what's Nathanael's response? Verse 49, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. You see it? These guys are getting sight. Like if you were paying attention as I read through verses 35 through 51, here's what you would see. Jesus is referred to by seven different names. Like these, the five people that are in this chapter, which are the four disciples and John the Baptist, they refer to Jesus by seven different names. Here they are, Lamb of God, Rabbi, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, King of Israel, Son of Man. The the Bible Project does a good job of just summarizing what we learn about Jesus from these seven names. Here it is. The fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the Messianic King and Teacher of Israel and the Son of God who will die for the sins of the world. And what we're talking about is these these disciples, Jesus hasn't died yet. He hasn't risen from the dead. He hasn't done the majority of his miracles. He hasn't done, given any of his messages. And yet these disciples have seeds of faith where they are declaring, there's no one else like you. Yes, you are a human, yet there's no other human like you. Because not only are you human, but you're from God and you reflect God and you will be king. And somehow you're gonna take away the sins of the world. They have sight. And when they saw him, what was their response? They followed him. That's why I tell you that following Jesus begins with seeing Jesus. No one truly follows Jesus without first seeing Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? No one truly follows Jesus without first seeing Jesus. So a good place for us to start tonight is simply by me asking, have you truly seen Jesus? Have you seen him as the the savior and the rescuer of the world that not one of us is born right with God? Every single one of us lives a life that is offensive to a pure and holy God. What that means is that we don't deserve God's love. We actually deserve his judgment and his wrath. Jesus Christ, who wasn't his God, came to earth to substitute himself in our place. He was punished so that we wouldn't have to be. The cross was our punishment for our sin, Jesus took it. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, the reason his resurrection is so important because that's when God the Father declared his payment for your sin is enough. Have you come to a point where you see your need for Jesus, that he's the savior of the world, that he left heaven coming for you to rescue you into a relationship with God? No one comes to the Father except 
through Jesus. He's Savior, but he's not just Savior. You cannot divorce Jesus being Savior from Jesus being King because Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father and he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. What do kings do? Kings reign. Kings rule. Have you seen Jesus? If you haven't, I just, I invite you to come See Jesus for who he is. He is savior, he is rescuer, he is king. First thing I need you to know about following Jesus is this. Following Jesus begins with seeing Jesus. The second thing that I need you to know, and if you consider yourself a Christian in this room, I hope that your ears are turned on. Here it is. Being a follower of Jesus involves following Jesus. Let me just say that one more time in case that feels earth shattering for you. Being a follower of Jesus involves, it involves following Jesus. So let, let me just explain in this passage what Jesus is doing is he is inviting these four people to become his disciples. As I said, disciple in the Greek, it literally just means learner. But Jesus has much greater hopes for these people than, than just simply viewing him as a teacher in them learning from him like he 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 has a vision of what it looks like to be his disciple to be a disciple of Christ is to be a follower of Christ and we see in this passage what Jesus's intention is for discipleship like for those who consider themselves followers of Jesus Christ let's just get Jesus's vision for us following him watch what happens verses 35 through 39 again Watch what it says. It says, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they, watch this, and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Here's Jesus's vision for being a follower of him. You, you spend your days with him. Like these people, Jesus is inviting them to come and see how he lives. Hey, you want to see where I live? Let me just show you where I live. This is where I sleep. If you're curious about what kind of bed I have, this is kind of it. If you want to see where I eat some of my meals, this is kind of the place where I do that. This is where I brush my teeth. This is the bathroom that we have. Like he's just saying, this is my life. And I love that it says they spent the day with him. Like, here's what I long for for my life. If there was a written account of every single day of Timothy Atik's life, my hope is that any one of you could pick it up and flip to any, any page of my life. And my hope is that every page would say, he spent the day with Jesus. That doesn't mean that I just go and sit in my room and pray all day. It just means that I live awake to the fact that the God of the universe is present with me every moment of every day. So there is never a moment. There's no car that I'm riding in, no place that I'm walking to, no meeting that I'm having where Jesus is not present. And so I hope that my, the book of my life reads Jesus or Timothy spent the day with Jesus. That's the vision that Jesus has. And then you look in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, which gives us another account of Jesus calling his followers. This is where we really get the words, follow me. It says this, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Watch this. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And watch what they did. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So we're just getting a snapshot of what true discipleship looks like. Jesus invites Simon and Andrew. He says, follow me. You know what they do? They change careers on the spot. 
They drop their nets, they leave their boat, their fishing counterparts, James and John, you know what it says about them when Jesus invited them to follow him? They don't even, they don't just leave their nets, they leave their dad sitting in the boat. Career change, just like that. See, following Jesus, it, it's that significant that you order your life around it. When he calls Levi, who's also known as Matthew, Matthew was a wicked man. He, was a, he chose to be a tax collector, which means his people, the Jews, hated him because he spent his life ripping off his own people, cheating his own people. It says this in Mark 2, And as he, that's Jesus, passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. When Jesus thinks about us following him, it, it means leaving lives of sin and saying, I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. Jesus is better. Jesus is worth it. So when you put all these things together, following Jesus, it looks like being awake to his presence, living every day with him, ordering your life around him, leaving sin for him, choosing him over anyone or anything else. That is what Jesus has in mind. Just think, this wasn't just a part of these guys' lives. It was a way of life for them. And just think about the trajectory of the disciples' lives. Like we're seeing the starting point. We are seeing where it all began. And where did it go? They lived every day with Jesus. They learned how to live from him. They enjoyed being with him. They watched him work. They were sharpened and corrected by him. They were entrusted with his mission. They wanted the world to know about him. And then many ended up dying because of him. Following Jesus was not just a part of their life. It was their way of life. So I, I need you to hear this. If you consider yourself a Christian, please listen. Jesus' intention is that every single Christian would be his disciple or his follower. That's his intention. That if you consider yourself a Christian, Jesus' desire for you is that you would be his disciple or his follower. Dallas Willard explains it beautifully. So if you want to know what it truly looks like to be Jesus' follower, it's this. He says, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Just think about that. That's what following Jesus is. Following Jesus is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. How would Jesus think? How would Jesus treat this person? How would Jesus study? How would Jesus operate on the weekends? What would Jesus do with his money? How would Jesus love others? What would Jesus do in this dating relationship? That's what following him looks like. It is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he weren't you. But let me, let's just get real for a moment. I look at the disciples in the trajectory that their lives were on. It started here. And then we see them ordering their lives around Jesus. And I look at some of our trajectories as Christians, and it feels like our trajectories are so different. And I know you can, you can sit there and say, yeah, but it was different because they were actually physically with Jesus. But yet Jesus says to these same people right before he's about to die, he says, it's actually better that I'm going to leave because then I'm going to send my spirit. So if you're a Christian, then God actually lives inside of you, whereas these guys had to look at Jesus, follow, and, and try their best. God actually lives inside of us to change us and make us more like Jesus. We get the better deal. And yet, if you look at some of our trajectories, it's so interesting because so many of us are often too busy for Jesus. Like we only have time to glance at Jesus every once in a while. We don't have time to sit 
and gaze at Jesus and behold his beauty. And because we don't have the time to sit and gaze at Jesus, Jesus feels like all duty and no delight. And because he's all duty and no delight, we find more joy in following influencers on Instagram than following Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. It brings us more joy. It stirs our affections more. It, it, it's easier for us to give our attention to those things. And not only that, we expect God's commands to submit to our feelings. We look at what he says and we say, I just don't feel convicted about that. And so what we end up doing is, is we end up defending sin. We say things like, it's just not that big of a deal. And this is just what people do in college. And then additionally, like we, we shop for churches. It's like, you know what, this church really doesn't do it for me. You know, the worship isn't as good here and I don't like the preaching as much. And you know, I'm just going to podcast my favorite people. And, and our trajectories just feel so different. And then some of us have even created a category for believing in Jesus without following Jesus. Like we, we've just become okay with believing in him without following him. Let me just ask you, am I, am I describing you? And I, please know, I didn't bring you here to beat you over the head. It's not like, welcome to Breakaway. Jesus loves you, but he hates you. Like that's not what I'm trying to do right now. I, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to have an honest conversation with us. Like if you're here and I'm describing you that you believe in Jesus, but you're not really following Jesus, let me just beg you to revisit what you believed in the first place. I'll explain it this way. Like one of the TV shows that my wife and I have binged a few times over the years is a show called Parks and Rec. I don't know if you've seen it. If you're not familiar with it, that's fine. But there is one of the characters on it is a guy named Tom Haverford. And Tom Haverford is this very interesting character. I don't have time to go into all the beauties and complexities of Tom Haverford, but early on in the show, we find out that Tom is married to this girl named Wendy, and it's this classic, how did that guy get that girl situation. Like people in the office look at Tom and they're like, it doesn't make sense. Like she's just better looking than you. Like Ron Swanson has like a, a scientific chart of beauty and he's like, she's like a 7.2 and you're like a three. I don't remember what the, the numbers are. Well, what, what we end up finding out is that Tom and Wendy are married because Wendy was Canadian. And so they kind of arranged this marriage so that she could get her citizenship. So it wasn't that they were in love, it was that it was an arrangement. It was an agreement to secure her citizenship. But then we find out Tom actually was in love with Wendy. But she doesn't reciprocate the feelings. For them, Tom loved Wendy, but Wendy just appreciated the agreement that secured her citizenship. The reason I tell you that is that if you believe in Jesus, but you don't follow Jesus, make sure that you haven't bought into the same type of arrangement with Jesus where you believe in Jesus because you need Jesus to secure your citizenship in heaven and he loves you, but you really don't want him. You just appreciate the arrangement that you believe began when you prayed a prayer, thus securing your ticket into heaven. Let, let me just say this. Heaven will not be filled with people who were scared of going to hell. Heaven will be filled with people who fell in love with Jesus. Okay? I, let me just say it one more time. Heaven will not be filled with people who are scared of hell. Heaven will be filled with people who fell in love with Jesus. So if you haven't seen Jesus, let me just beg you to come and see. And if you're sitting there saying, you know what? I do believe in Jesus, but I don't feel like I'm following Jesus. Let me just give you the answer. Like, here is the answer. And I just kind of said it, but let me just say it again. Here's the answer 
get where you can see. Get where you can see Jesus. Like if, if you ask me to officiate your wedding one day, then if you're the groom, here's what you need to know. And I've shared this at Breakaway before, but right before we walk out, like before you and I walk out in front of the groomsmen and we take our place and, and we're standing there and all the bridesmaids come down, right before that, you and I are going to be in a back room somewhere and here's what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say, hey, when we get out there, you get where you can see. Because when those doors open up, it's going to be the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen. But here's what's going to happen. All of these jokers are going to stand up and they're going to try and get in your way. So if you need to step in front of me, if you need to get on my shoulders, you do whatever you need to do. But you get where you can see. I remember performing one wedding and I told this guy that. All the people stood up and it was outdoors. There was this back wall behind us. He climbed up on the wall just so that he could see his wife. And I was like, pound it. That's the, that's what. That's what I'm talking about. And so here's what I'm saying. For some of you, the reason you don't see Jesus is you have all these other distractions. There's all these other distractions in your life. It's like, okay, Jesus, I, you're, you're there. I checked in a breakaway, but now I need to check social media, and I've got 18 hours, and then I've got 10 organizations I need to go to. You know what? Let me just encourage you. Get where you can see Jesus. Like, I, let me just share from my own life. This summer, I've been getting where I can see Jesus like no other time in my life. And one of the things that I've been learning is that quantity of time is essential to quality time with Jesus. And, and I remember during one of my times of just sitting with Jesus, he brought to mind Psalm 1611, which says this. It says, you make known to me the path of life. And then it says this, in your presence... There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And when I thought about that wording, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Here's what I felt like the Lord told me in that moment. Anytime that you meet with Jesus and there's no joy, you've missed him completely. Like if there's no joy, in your time with God, whatever that looks like, whether that's sitting down to read a few verses or reading through some devotional that someone has written, if there's, if there's no joy, Jesus isn't in it. Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So you know what I've been doing? I have been sitting with Jesus longer in pressing forward until I know the joy of being with him in his presence. And the reason I tell you that is because I've been sensing more enjoyment in my time with God than ever before. And here's what happens because enjoyment is increasing. Time with Jesus moves faster. So there's times where it's like, oh my gosh, it's already been X number of minutes or that long. And now I, actually, I really do need to get to work, but this was just so, this was good. Here's what happens. Okay, don't miss it. Once you see him, you want to see more of him. And once you see more of him, the more you see of him, the more you want to be with him and following him just becomes more natural. You see that progression? You see him, you want to see more of him. The more you see him, the more you want to be with him and following him just becomes more natural. When I talk about following Jesus, I'm not talking about doing more. I'm talking about gazing more. Okay? The third thing that I want you to know is this. Following Jesus leads to others following Jesus. So let's just catch up. Following Jesus begins with seeing Jesus. Following Jesus involves being a follower of Jesus involves following Jesus and then number three following Jesus leads to others following Jesus did you see how things progressed in this passage just watch John the Baptist sees Jesus he declares his identity in two of John the Baptist's followers like so there's two guys who are following John the Baptist John the Baptist is like look Lamb of God. And they're like, peace out, John the Baptist. And they begin to follow Jesus. 
which I actually love. Like if you're planning to go into ministry, that's the goal. It's not to accumulate followers, it's to cultivate followers of Jesus Christ. That's just free of charge for those thinking about full-time ministry. But watch what happens when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. This is why we named our second son Andrew, is because of this verse. Simon Peter's brother, he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we've found the Messiah, which means Christ. Watch this, verse 40, 42. He brought him to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? He brought him to Jesus. Philip Jesus finds Philip and says two words to him, follow me. Philip starts following him. Look at what verses 45 and 46 say. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. You see that? Following Jesus leads to others following Jesus. I'll put it a different way. When you see Jesus, you want others to see Jesus as well. Now, I, I just want to point out that in this passage, we actually see four of the main ways that people become Christians. Like if you look at it, you can probably find your story in this passage that we're talking about. Some people become Christians because of a leader in their life. That's what happened with Andrew. His leader, his teacher, John the Baptist says, Jesus, Lamb of God, Andrew starts following him. Maybe that's your story. Maybe there's a pastor or a Bible study leader or a young life leader or a leader in one of your student organizations and they have lovingly and gently shown you Jesus and you put your faith in Jesus. Maybe that's your story. But then you look at, you look at Simon and how did Simon begin following Jesus? It's because of his brother. Andrew came and got him and was like, we found the Messiah, you gotta see this guy. And maybe that's your story. Maybe you grew up with parents who loved Jesus or maybe it's a sibling who just said, hey, I'm taking you to church with me. And somebody in your family has lovingly shown you Jesus and you've put your trust in Christ. That's my story. It's a combination of the two. I was going to a day camp where leaders were sharing the gospel with me and then my mom actually prayed with me to receive Christ. But then there's Philip. Philip, Jesus just showed up directly to Philip and was like, follow me, and he was in. And maybe that's your story. Maybe Jesus has just met you in a moment. Maybe you've reached rock bottom or you've been in a time of trial or crisis or maybe you've just found yourself searching for answers and you've just opened up the Bible and started reading and Jesus has introduced himself to you and you put your faith in Christ. But then you think, look at Nathaniel. How did Nathaniel begin following Jesus? His friend came to him. It was like, hey man, come and see. And maybe that's your story. Maybe one of your friends has just been like, man, you, you're coming to break away with me. You're coming to church with me. I just want to share with you how God has changed my life. And because of a friend, you've put your faith in Christ. Just think about what God has done in your life through a leader or a family member or a friend. Now I want you to think, what can God do through you? And who does he want to bring to him through you? You know where a good place to start if you're like, man, I, I don't even know where to start when it comes to reaching people for Christ. Well, just look at this passage. Start with your followers, your family, or your friends. Start with your family. Like who in your family doesn't know Jesus? Who among your friends doesn't know Jesus? Who among your followers? Like if you're a leader in a student organization, or is there anyone in your organization that doesn't know Jesus? Can you just envision a day where those people put their trust in Christ? Just think how God might want to use you. And I just want to give you some encouragement like based on this passage, you just need to remember some people in your life, whether it's family, friends, or followers, all they need is an invitation. Like that's all they need. Some people just need an invitation. Like if you read the text, Simon shows no sign of resistance. Andrew comes is like, we found the Messiah and he goes. Some people, that's all they need. All they need is an invitation. I am convinced, and I hope you don't miss this, 
There's roughly 80,000 college students in this town between A&M, Blinn, and Rellis. I'm convinced that somewhere between at least 10 and 30,000 of those students would automatically say yes to coming to Breakway or going to church on Sunday morning if you would simply ask them. And just imagine this, I am convinced that at least five to 10,000 of the students in this city would trust Christ tomorrow if someone would just simply explain the gospel to them. Just imagine, 5,000 people tomorrow. Why? Because you never know what Jesus is doing in someone's life. And then some of you just need to hear, resistance, it's okay. Resistance is okay. You remember Nathaniel's story? Philip comes and is like, hey, we found the guy. He's from Nazareth. He's like, hold up. Nazareth? Nothing good's coming out of that town. You see that? Skepticism. Skepticism. There's resistance. But what does Philip do? He doesn't, he doesn't be like, oh, sorry, dude. Yeah, forget it. And he's like, come and see. Let's go, Nathaniel. That's so Nathaniel. You are so... You, you, you're so Nathaniel right now. Come and see. And what happens? Jesus shows up. He's like, oh, Nathaniel. Yeah, I saw you. When you were sitting under that fig tree, he's like, when did you see me? Surely you're the son of God. Isn't that crazy? It's just awesome. So like, don't be shaken if someone tells you no. Just keep asking. Keep inviting people to break away. Never come here alone. Invite people. Don't be afraid of a no to church on Sunday morning because you never know when someone's just going to say yes because you never know when Jesus is going to show up in their life and be like, yeah, I saw you, but when you didn't know it, I see you now. I know your name and you're coming with me. You just never know. So here's what I want to tell you. Let me just tell you a few ways this week you can begin pointing people to Jesus. I want to get real practical. Let me just give you a few. Number one, pray fervently for courage, boldness, and opportunities. Number two, faithfully invite people to places where you know Jesus will be proclaimed. Invite people to break away. We have more room here, people. Invite people. I promise you, I will proclaim Jesus every week. And there are dozens of great churches in this city proudly proclaiming Jesus every single Sunday. Number three, give God credit for the work he's doing in your life when you're talking to unbelievers. Don't be fake about it, but just give God credit where it is naturally due. So there's times where I'm talking to unbelievers and I'm like, yeah, I'm so thankful that God brought us to College Station and God is doing a good work at a ministry that I lead called Breakaway. I'm just giving God credit because that's his. God brought Kat and I together. God has given us three kids. I'm just giving him credit for what is rightfully his. Number four, ask people good questions. I love the friend that my friend JP asks, do you have a faith? That's a simple question to ask someone. Hey, do you have a faith? Opens the door. Another question that I ask people sometimes, is there anything you need that I can ask God to help you with? Another one, if someone's going through a tough time, where do you find peace and hope in tough times like this? Number five, start an explorer group. Just grab a few people and say, hey, look, here's what I want to do. I want to read through the book of John together. The book of John is just all about Jesus. I just want to have a weekly meeting for us to explore faith together. Are you interested? Like this is great for you to do with your fraternity or your sorority or your student organization. Just say, hey, could we meet once a week and just talk about faith, explore it together. And then number six, live a surrendered life. Like live a life that declares Jesus is worth it. I love what Jim Elliott, missionary who was killed by a jungle tribe in Ecuador, listen to what he says. He says in, in a prayer, he says, Father, make me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another in facing Christ in me. That's what you want. For someone to look in your life, see Jesus, and be like, I've got to do something with that. I want to end tonight 
just by looking at what we've just talked about, and I want to give you a vision for a fully functioning faith. Like what I'm really telling you now, it, it's an opportunity for you to decipher if your faith is, is healthy right now. So this is what a fully functioning faith looks like as a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? Don't miss it. Seeing Jesus, it starts with seeing Jesus, and we'll put this up on the board, but seeing Jesus leads to entrusting your life in eternity to him. So seeing leads to entrusting. Seeing Jesus leads to entrusting your life in eternity to Jesus. Entrusting your life to him leads to following him, and following him leads to inviting others to follow him. So do you see it? There's four steps. Seeing, entrusting, following, inviting. So I'll, like to, I'll kind of explain it like this, like for you to determine if you're a healthy Aggie or not. Like your experience in Aggie land, it, it probably began with people telling you, oh, a and amazing. Maybe your parents or some friends, you got to go there. You came on a college visit. And when you came on a college visit, you truly saw a and in a way that made you say, I got to come here. Like you saw it. And seeing led to entrusting. And so you showed up here. You moved in here. You enrolled, you began paying tuition, you entrusted yourself for the next four or five years to Texas A&M. Now you're in a sense following Texas A&M. You went to fish camp, you went to impact, you've gone to yell practice, you've gone to the football games, you are all in. There's no 2%ing here. Like maroon is like a key component in your wardrobe now. And then you're going to get your ring one day. And when you graduate, you don't stop being an Aggie. You know, you're just a former student and you're going to name your dog Jimbo and you're going to name your kid Reveille. And like you are going to be all in with a and for the rest of your life. And anytime you come across a high school student that doesn't know what they're going to do with their future, you're like, I know what you're doing with your future. You're going to Texas A&M because there is no place on earth like Texas A&M. And so you take that, and now you think about Jesus, just kind of where are you at? Like, have you seen Jesus? If you haven't seen Jesus, then let me just encourage you, get where you can see him. Like, sit at Breakaway, sit in a Bible study with some friends, sit in your dorm with your Bible, sit until you see him. And maybe you're seeing him for the first time tonight. If you're seeing him for the first time tonight, would you entrust your life to him? Would you come to a place where you just say, Jesus, you can have my life. Would you be my savior? I give my life to you. And if you've entrusted your life to Jesus, would you, would you follow Jesus? Would you tonight ask the Holy Spirit to go to work in you and make your life more like Jesus's life? And if you're following Jesus, would you invite others to come and see Jesus? Would you just can cultivate a life of invitation? Would you invite people to come and see him? Would you even sit tonight and ask God to bring to mind one person and one thing you can do with that person to begin to invite them to come and see Jesus? The invitation to all of us is two words, follow me. It's uncertain at times, there's risk involved, but adventure is most certain and the reward can be great.